Hello everybody, my name is Chris Brady, author of the Boeing 737 Tech Guide and the Boeing 737 Tech Site, and this presentation is about the Gravel Runway Kit. So for, by way of scope and disclaimer, this presentation will be covering the Gravel Runway Kit on the uh, option on the Boeing 737-1 and 200s, and for those of you lucky enough to still be flying it, please always treat your company training and manuals as the authoritative source of information. So I'll be covering the, the, the system in general, the landing surface requirements, external modifications to the aircraft, the flight deck controls and indicators, and the operational procedures and limitations. So the gravel runway kit was also known as the unpaved strip kit. Um, and that, I guess, was to indicate the fact that it, it was not confined to gravel operations, but also dirt or grass strips. It was an option made available to, for the 737-1 and 200s only um, as early as February 1969, so right back in the early days of the of the aircraft. As I say, it allowed the aircraft to operate from gravel, dirt or grass strips, and its peak of operation, 737s were making over 2,000 movements a year from unpaved runways, so it was it was a fairly successful option. Uh, 737 200 gravel operations are actually still ongoing in 2021 as and I, as I record this message. Um, although one of the last operators, Canadian North, have just announced the retirement of their, their last two uh, gravel 737 200 combis. The first one will be going in May 2021 and the last will be going before next year, before 2022. So a little about the, the landing surface, so what, whatever surface was to be used, a uh, bit gravel, dirt, grass, certain guidelines had to be observed. The surface had to be smooth, with no ruts or bumps higher than 3 inches in 100 feet, or 4 inches in 200 feet. Had to have good drainage, with, with no standing water or ruts. And the surface material had to be at least 6 inches thick, with no areas of deep, loose gravel. Boeing offered a survey service to assess the suitability of potential strips. If a surface was not particularly hard, it could still be used by reducing the tyre pressure down to a minimum of 40 psi. And to give you an idea, normal tyre pressures are, are between about 100 and 190 psi for the for the 200. Um, and that reduction could be done in accordance with a with with a chart, depending on the 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 max takeoff weight that you were going to operate with. The following video shows a landing on wet gravel at uh, Annette Island up in Alaska. Um, as is normal for all performance testing, it's actually made without the use of, of reverse thrust uh, to cater for the for the reverse thrust um, in op case. And you can clearly see from this still photo that there are standing water patches on the runway and. Uh, you can see in the moment I've just captured in in this this video grab that uh, that there's a, a large splash of water coming up from the from the nose and mains. So uh, definitely wet conditions. Uh, part of the gravel runway performance testing, the 737 was tested on a wet gravel runway in natural rain at Annette Island, Alaska. The runway there is 5,700 feet long. Again as on other landing tests, the airplane is landed and brought to a stop with wheel brakes only without using reverse thrust. Again, because of the high moisture content in the air, you can see the uh, vortex from the trailing edge flaps as the airplane makes it approach for this landing. I think you will agree as you observe this that this is a very wet gravel runway. The nose gear gravel def de deflector is is probably one of the more noticeable uh, external changes to the aircraft, and it's made of corrosion-resistant steel, 
and it's got a sheet metal leading edge which acts as an aerofoil to give it aerodynamic stability. You can actually see in the photo that it's curled up there to give it that sort of uh, bulbous leading edge, you know, aerofoil shape. When the gear retracts, the deflector is hydraulically rotated around the underneath of the nose wheel, so that, that will be clockwise as we look at it in this photo before seating into the fairing at the front of the nose wheel well, which again you can just see on, on this photo, that, that, that fairing uh, in, in front of the nose wheel well there. The rotation is programmed to maintain the deflector in a nose up attitude during transit. No extra crew action is required to use the deflector and in the event of a manual gear extension, springs and rollers will position it correctly. You can actually see these the, 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 the springs and rollers better in the in this photograph and the, the, the brace struts to the side of the of the springs. The maximum speed for gear operation, um, and that's either retraction or extension, it's reduced considerably to 180 knots. Um, and the maximum speed with gear extended is only 200 knots. Uh, and for the for the 73200 it was actually an incredible 320 knots normally. Note that the ground clearance of this uh, this nose gear unit is only three and a half inches. Um, this is enough to allow for, for flat tyre clearance but care must be taken of crossing um, arrestor cables um, and if you do so particularly try and avoid taxiing over the, the, the donuts that, that support the cables uh, at intervals along, the, along its length. The next video up is of an early unpaved strip uh, proving flight up at uh, Hope Park in British Columbia in September 1972. Now the narrators of this are the the, the original 737 test pilots, Lou, Lou Wallach and Brian Weigel, who were the um, who were the two TPs that, that that made the maiden flight of the 737. They're talking about trials at uh, at Hope and how they lost the, the nose gear gravel deflector in the grass. Um, just a word about the the video grab still that I've taken that you can see on the right of the picture. Um, it shows quite well the, the the fairing in front of the nose gear where the um, where the deflector sits into. Uh, that's lit up well in the in in the sunlight in this photo. Also, look at the at the front of the of the engines. You, you can see three. Uh, holes there in the in the cowling. That's the early auxiliary inlet doors, um, which were on the very first models of the JT8. Okay, on with the video. This is Hope, British Columbia. It's a grass runway that's uh, what 4,200, 4,500 feet long. 4,500 feet. And uh, some of you may be familiar with this airport. It's generally light airplanes and gliders use it. <laughs> I believe you might observe here that uh, the airplane stops in very nicely on this grass runway. We did both dry grass and wet grass up there, but we had to uh, call some tanker trucks in and have them spray or spread water on the airport to make it wet. Now the no ski is not on here, Lou. It, uh, some of these shots are backwards, but there must be a reason why that ski's been removed. Well, yeah, it turned into a uh, a plow rather than a ski up there. It dug into the <laughs> dirt, and we ran over it, and it ended up behind the nose gear instead of being beside it. I it's remember on there. Yeah, there it is. Well, we got a time machine. Uh, I remember being on the. Uh, budgeting side of this exercise, and I believe the Hope Airport authorities billed us pretty heavily to get the ruts out of that uh, airport. We, uh, we did grade it for them and yeah. <laughs> smooth it out again. Main gear gravel deflectors were, uh, were, were also required, and uh, a little difficult to see in this photo because it's, it's slightly out of focus on the mains, um, but you can just see it uh, there, I've indicated it in red. Um, they're between the main landing gear bogies, um, and th th they're just a, a, a piece of sort of very stiff, sort of rubbery canvas that um, a bit like a, a mud flap on a on a bike, uh, just to keep the gravel down. There are also protective metal shields over the uh, hydraulic tubing and brake cables on the the main landing gear strut. 
and also protective metal shields over the, the speed brake cables as well just to, to um, re reduce any opportunity for damage to, to these cables. Uh, the flaps were, were protected as well. Um, the photograph there is of the the wing to body seal which is known uh, amongst the engineers as the elephant's ears fairings as you can see from its shape. Um, so on that elephant's ear uh, the, there was a metal edge band fitting to the to the leading edge of it just for again for fob protection otherwise it would it would just wear away to, to nothing because it was sort of sandblasted by the gravel. The underside of the the inboard flaps were reinforced with glass fibre um, and there's also abrasion resistant teflon paint or, or teflon base paint on, on, on the wing and fuselage on the surface structures. Also the, the under fuselage DME, ATC and VHF ant antennas uh, were, were strengthened as well. Inside the wheel well there's a tyre screen to protect the critical components from debris uh, from damage sorry if, uh, if debris is flung into the wheel well from, from an unpaved strip or from, from damaged from, uh, from a burst tyre on, on retraction. Inside the flight deck there's a tyre screen light on the, on the doors panel there and this will illuminate if the tyre screen is not secure. The vortex dissipator is also fairly notable um, ad addition to, to gravel kit aircraft. These prevent vortices forming at the engine intakes which could cause gravel to be ingested by the engine. And um, they consist of a small four projecting tube which blows pressure regulated bleed air at 55 psi down and aft from, from, the, from three nozzles at the, at the tip of each one to break up the vortices. The vortex effect dissipator effectiveness has been demonstrated in crosswinds of up to 20 knots. So this photo shows the, and it's a little difficult to see, but if, if you look below the, um, the, the nozzle, you can actually see the, the airflow pattern in the gravel. You, you may just be able to see three um, shapes in the gravel, three, three sort of ovals, a large one at the center and two smaller ones at, at the, 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 the side lobes. And that's just to illustrate the, uh, the, the airflow pattern of the, um, of the vortex dissipator and, and illustrate what it does. In, in doing that, it, it, it stops the engine being able to, to hoover up gravel or, or any other, uh, Debris or, or 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 fod on the on the unpaved surface, um, because the the vortex isn't allowed to form because of these um, these vortex dissipators. Um, unfortunately for for us as crew, the, these vortex dissipators were, were were seem to be located perfectly at, at knee height. So you you if if you forgot you had them on or if you forgot they were they were there, you you bump into them on walk rounds which was a, a bit of a pain but um, as uh, as the Pavlovian dog response would, would, would work you'd, you'd soon get used to it. This last photo of the vortex dissipators is just a close-up um, of the the actual nozzles just to show that there, uh, there are three there. What, what you can't see from this photo is they're actually angled slightly backwards as well just just because that, that was the optimum position for, for vortex dissipation. So the controls for the vortex dissipator are in the flight deck with this switch here, the, the gravel protect switch. Um, it's, it's a three position switch and it, um, it's solenoid held so it's, it's a bit like the wing anti-ice switch. Um, off obviously does what it says on the tin, that, that's that's straightforward. The on position is, is the solenoid held position. Um, so on the ground you you would put this on one, once the engines are running and it it would hold the uh, the, the, the 
the the uh, the switch in the on position, i.e. the the air going through the, the bleed air going through the vortex dissipators. That so the vortex dissipators will be working at all times up until the point you you get airborne, and then it will flick off on a on a squat switch. In flight, you would put this on before landing, and nothing would happen other than the switch would stay in the on position until touchdown and the 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 squat the squat switch would then kick in and activate the um the the vortex dissipator automatically on touchdown and it would stay on until you shut the engines down the now the nozzles and the boom the the things that you saw in the previous photo they themselves require anti-ice protection um, so there's a third position for the, for this gravel protect switch which is the upper position which is which is anti-ice and when you put that on in 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 flight this this would be then uh, that that was the vortex dissipator would would operate, and the bleed air would would warm that that probe up, and uh, and give it anti ice protection. The test function of the anti ice position uh, can be used for an in flight test of the of the gravel protect system. There is an an AFM limitation which says that the gravel protect switch must be on or at the anti ice test position at any time the engines are running on the ground, which makes sense. Okay, full disclosure: if you can't tell, this photo is photoshopped. <laughs> the um, unfortunately, the the gravel protect um, uh, captions uh, were in op on the aircraft I I, I was on that day. Um, so there were two in-op stickers over it, but I've I've photoshopped up what the caption looks like. So it's a green caption, and it says "Gravel Protect," and uh, there ab above the the engine instrument secondary panel, and they're there just to to warn the crew that that the system is on, or indeed, if you've put the system on, put the switch on, and uh, and it's not w worked, then um, then it will. It won't illuminate, so you'll know it's not on. Um, and that warns crew of the of the bleed and EPA Im, Im implications of this being on, um, because obviously the, the, there's an an, an EPA re reduction and a, and a and a bleed air demand on on this system. Takeoff and landing should be made with the engine bleeds off when you're using this to ensure there's sufficient bleed air for the, for their effective operation. Um, if you need air conditioning, then you can use APU bleed air if required. But engine bleeds, um, engine bleeds should be off. Another modification is that the lower anti-collision light is retractable. Um, this isn't an automatic function. Um, it 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 comes on with the anti-collision light on. Um, there's an AFM limitation for its use, which says don't use the retractor position of the light, except to protect the retractor, the retractable anti-collision light during landing. Uh, I after selection of landing flaps on gravel, and there's a there's a blue caption there which uh, retract, which which tells you that it's it's retracted. All right, what about the use of reverse thrust? Um, now this this video, which was narrated by uh, Ken Higgins uh, and another very famous Boeing t test pilot. It shows landing on gravel at uh, Half Lake Sioux City and it shows how the use of reverse thrust doesn't pose a, a, a FOD ingestion ha hazard. That said, there's an AFM limitation which states that when landing on gravel use approximately idle reverse. Uh, don't exceed 1.8 EPA and stow the reverses by approximately 60 knots. OK, let's see the video. Earlier pictures showed the takeoffs that were done in on gravel runways in 737. This, this is a shot of a landing in a 737 at Lake Havasu City for the same purpose, except that this is the landing case. 
This test shows that thrust reversers do not blow gravel back uh, so that the gravel would be ingested by the engines, thereby damaging the engines. All right, finally a word on operational procedures uh, and limitations, of which there are many. Um, there are actually two AFM appendices for, um, for, for gravel runway. The, the gravel runway configuration's got one of its own and the vortex dissipator installation has another. All right, so quick run through these, um, these procedures and limitations, the ones that we haven't covered already. Uh, the first one is that anti-skid must be on for takeoff and landing, uh, gravel runway ops, and obviously perhaps the vortex dissipators must be on for takeoff and landing. Again, th these are only if operating on gravel runways or unpaved strips. If you, if you're operating on a on a regular runway, these particular things don't have to be observed. Thrust should be kept at a minimum to to sustain a slow taxi speed, and what what they mean by this is that, is that they don't want you to come to a, a, a full stop wherever possible uh, because you'll need more breakaway thrust to start moving again. The maximum taxi per on gravel is 1.4. That's a, that's a hard AFM limitation. Takeoff with flat positions 1 or 2 is not permitted on gravel. Uh, I presume they want you to use more flaps so that you get airborne earlier um, and, and away from the gravel. Flap protect switch, um, the anti-ice position must be used when using engine inlet anti-ice. Okay. The use of rudder pedal steering rather than the tiller is recommended to make all turns as large as possible to prevent the nose gear from digging in. Yeah, the, the the risk with using the tiller is that is that you you're using too much um, deflection of the of the nose gear, um, which which can cause it just just to plow in. So um, the rudder pedal steering will 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 benefit that. If the runway is dusty, try and maneuver so that your jet blast doesn't pick up any loose debris that may be blown black over the runway in a crosswind should be allowed to settle before starting the takeoff roll. So again, the, the, this is all advice and a, and a balance. It's not a hard limitation, but it's a, it's a top tip for operating on uh, on gravel runways. Notwithstanding the above, use a rolling takeoff wherever possible to avoid debris ingestion when takeoff thrust is set. EPA should be limited to 1.4 or less before brake release. As we've already said, that that's a that's an AFM limitation for for taxi EPA on gravel. Takeoffs and landings should be um, should use engine bleed air for air conditioning. The sorry, the engine bleed air for for, for conditioning should not be used. So uh, the takeoff and landing should should be bleed air off. For landings, use of order brake is recommended, and when landing on gravel, use approximately idle reverse, not to exceed one point eight EPA and stow the reverses by approximately 60 knots. That is uh, yet another AFM limitation. All right, so that's everything I know on uh, on gravel runway ops. As always, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel. Many thanks.